Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Sustainable Jersey's 2021 Sustainability Summit and the presentation of Want a Healthier Community? Go for the gold. I'm Lauren Skaronsky, Program Director for Community Engagement at Sustainable Jersey, and I'm excited to welcome you here today. Um, after our presentations, we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. And so speaking of Q&A, uh, we would love for you to write your questions down using the Q&A function, follow that green arrow. You can list your questions there and we will do our best to get uh, responses to you by the end of the session. You can also use the chat function, which is where the orange arrow is to share resources and thoughts with others. But we ask that you not put questions there because um, they kind of get lost in the stream of, of chatting. And so uh, if we have everything, all the questions over in the Q&A, that would make life a lot easier. The presenters might ask you a question, might have a poll uh, and ask you to raise your hand. You can do that following that blue arrow by, uh, pressing the raise hand button. We also are live streaming uh, this, uh, sorry, we're providing a live transcript of today's presentation, closed captioning. So you should be seeing the closed captioning going on across the bottom of your screen. Um, if you do not have that uh, function, you need to enable it. So you can follow that orange uh, arrow by clicking live transcript. And then also uh, a little uh, sub menu comes up, click show subtitle, and uh, then you will be able to see the words going across your screen. If you see them and you don't want them there, follow the same steps and then click hide subtitle. Um, also, because this is a webinar, your camera is not being shown. So don't worry about uh, the fact that you're in pajamas or outside walking around, we can't see you. Um, and also this event is being recorded. And so um, the recordings and presentations will be posted on the Sustainable Jersey website by next week. Before we start, I will um, give a couple, of, couple more announcements. The um, municipal certification deadline is coming up on June 6th and the final school certification deadline on June 21st. So those dates are coming up soon, get your submissions in. Um, also, we are providing free technical assistance for one community to uh, develop a water story, which is a, the foundational and required action for water gold. So that is coming to you from New Jersey American Water, and you can find out more information on our grants page following that link. Also, um, more grant money, $75,000 worth from Atlantic City Electric, we are giving uh, grants for resiliency and environmental stewardship projects to towns that are within the ACE service territory. So you can find out more information also on our grants page. I'd like to take a moment just to thank our summit sponsors. You can see them listed here on the, the slide and also our program underwriters, um, New Jersey's Clean Energy Program, Dodge Foundation, and the New Jersey School Boards Association who help keep our program running. Without uh, these guys, we wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do the summit. So thank you all for making this possible. Um, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. You're gonna hear from me. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the forthcoming Gold Star Standard in Health. Um, and then Karen Lowry, who is Associate Director at Blaustein School of Public Policy and, and Planning. She's going to talk to us today about health and all policies and how uh, your town can implement that. Um, Chuck Latini, who is the president of APA New Jersey, will talk to us about um, incorporating health into land use decision making and uh, its relation to the master plan. And Michael Richmond, who is the attorney for the New Jersey Local Boards of Health Association, will talk to us about those elusive local boards of health that every town in New Jersey is uh, required to have uh, and, and what the connection is to sustainable Jersey, why we're even talking about them. So let's get started. Um, I wanted to start with this question, what makes some people healthy and others unhealthy? It's not just about genetics. Uh, there are environment and societal system impacts that play a big part on how uh, well we live and how long we live. They are called, also known as social and environmental determinants of health. Those are the conditions that impact, as I said, how long we live and how well we live. 
So I want you to just remember the social and environmental determinants of health because we're going to reference them throughout the rest of this presentation. Another way to look at it is through this graphic from King County, Washington. Um, if each one of us were the tree, you can see that all of these different social and environmental conditions, which are acting as the roots, they have an impact on the health of that tree or us as that tree. So for example, uh, access to affordable, safe and quality housing, affordable, healthy food that comes from local sources, um, access to parks, access to safe community, um, you know, access to safe and efficient transportation, just and equitable systems. Those are all what are considered social and environmental conditions or determinants of health that can impact individuals and the community at large, the health of. So if we're talking about how long you live, this is a really good um, snapshot right here from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, it's Mercer County, and it shows the discrepancy between life expectancy of residents living in different towns within Mercer. So if we look at the red, um, the red numbers, those are where the life expectancy is the shortest. And as the color gets more yellowish, that's uh, a longer life expectancy. So here in Trenton, uh, where the red numbers are, you see an average lifespan all the way down to 73 years old. Uh, further up the road, a couple of miles, you get into Lawrence Township, and that expands up to 83 years of age. Further up a couple of miles, up Route 1, and you're now in West Windsor, where the average life expectancy is 87 years. That is 14 years difference between, on average, between some residents in Trenton and some residents in West Windsor. Why do you think that is? Well, could be that maybe the residents in Trenton have less access to healthy, nutritious, and affordable food. Um, maybe it's because there's greater environmental hazards from decades long industry that impact the, the water quality and air quality in, in the city. Um, maybe because there's a greater stock of older homes that have greater toxic exposure, for example, you know, lead impacting the children that live there. Uh, maybe it's because the residents in West Windsor have more access to open and recreation spaces so they can get out there and be more fit and active. Um, or maybe those residents in West Windsor have, uh, you know, they own their own cars so they can uh, leave town and go to where there might be more jobs uh, that are, you know, applicable to their skills. Maybe they can get to supermarkets that are a couple miles away that aren't accessible by public transport to be able to get that healthy and affordable food. No matter what the why is, I think we can all agree that this is not a just and equitable system. And so when we talk about health equity, that's what we're talking about. Uh, that everyone has access to the resources and programming that can help them live longer and healthier. So another uh, look at this from a higher level, uh, this is a chart put together from county health rankings. Um, the green element, are the health outcomes, that's basically, if we're looking at this from a community-wide level, how healthy are the residents that live within the community or the people who work within the community today. So how long and how well will they live based on their health today? So, you know, we talk about, this is where chronic disease would fit in, you know, levels of obesity and diabetes and heart disease. Um, sorry, asthma, I meant not obesity, but are they obese? Um, are they depressed? Do they regularly go to the doctor? Um, do they have significant nutritional def deficiencies? These are the types of health outcomes that uh, can be impacted. And so moving down to the blue, the health factors, these are, this is also known as the social and environmental determinants of health. So everything in blue are the factors or the conditions that can impact the community's health individually as well as on a whole. So, you know, you talk about individual behaviors, um, it's, that's a good amount. That's a big part, 30%. Um, that's, you know, substance use, diet and exercise. How much of that are people getting? Um, and then, you know, if you go down to the bottom of the chart, you've got physical environment. That's where air and water quality play a part, housing and transportation. 
Uh, and then the orange, the policies and programs, this is, this is the sweet spot. This is where we have the opportunity to create communities where everyone has the chance to live long and healthy lives. This is where Sustainable Jersey is particularly uh, interested in. And so, you know, for the past two years, Sustainable Jersey has been working on building a new gold star in health. Uh, what we've done is amass a, a very large number of public health experts from the local to the state level, also experts in uh, that, that work in those determinants of health areas like transportation and food and um, land use, planning, things like that. So what we did was we built a gold star that will address the social and environmental determinants of health by helping municipalities develop programs and policies that will not only tackle the issues impacting public health, but also influence in the individual behaviors where appropriate. And we say where appropriate because, you know, government can only go so far as to how much authority they have to impact individual behaviors. You know, they can't, they can only regulate your behavior on, on a small scale. So um, what it also does is it builds a culture, we, we were working towards building a culture of health at the municipal level. So, you know, where can we incorporate health in municipal decision making? Where are those opportunities to have uh, the health leaders within a community, local board of health, the health officers at the table with the planning folks, with the public works, with recreation departments, when those, you know, programs and decisions are being made that relate to those departments, having health, getting health a seat at that table is important. Also, um, where municipalities can collaborate with community stakeholders. So building those relationships out there um, so that, you know, it can be a more robust and, um, you know, community-wide uh, process to be able to uh, take into account the impacts that these programs and policies are going to have on the residents and the people that work there. Also, institutionalizing these procedures is, is very important, as well as addre addressing the issues of health equity. And so what we worked to do from the start was to understand what the municipal role was in impacting the determinants of health. As I had already mentioned, we know that you know, impacting individual behaviors is, is not somewhere where municipal, municipal governments really have a strong hold. However, there are places where they really do have key authorities, um, planning and, and zoning decisions, regulating housing and, and the quality of water, building those transportation networks, creating those wellness programs and, and creating uh, community safety programs. Um, and what we found was that the, the strategies that were really high impact on addressing health and the determinants of health really overlapped nicely with sustainability and, and specifically the Sustainable Jersey Program. If you think about the different categories of our actions, land use, transportation, food, uh, diversity and equity. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of overlap between our program and the the determinants of health. So that was that was a really nice uh, starting point. And so what Health Gold starts with is an assessment of local issues because we want towns to be able to dig into um, you know hyper locally on the ground what's going on in their community. So a very high level snapshot of what Health Gold is going to look like. And again, there will be more forthcoming once we launch this at the end of July. Um, this is a, a high level snapshot of the framework for Health Gold. So uh, you can see, as I mentioned, the first step is this local health needs assessment. So towns are going to look at what are the health outcomes? What's, what is the data saying about the health outcomes within our community? Is there high obesity, high heart disease? Um, you know, are people, do they lack access to being able to get to the doctor and, you know, to get access, you know, healthy food, things like that. And then to look at, you know, what are, what are the conditions within the community that are impeding? What are the barriers for people to get to the towns to, uh, sorry, to get to the doctors, to get to the, the healthy food? Um, 
And, and then to look at what role can the municipal government play in addressing those conditions and, and um, you know, bettering those conditions. And all along the way in that assessment, uh, the community is involved. There's a community stakeholder process. And so once the, the um, town figures out, okay, these are our major issues and they prioritize the health issues, then they can start looking at solutions. And so that's where Sustainable Jersey comes in. These colored uh, boxes are the different categories of where there will be new as well as existing Sustainable Jersey actions kind of rolled in for options uh, to choose from in order to get that gold star in health. So that's a really um, quick snapshot of Health Gold. As I mentioned, more to come. Um, the end of July, we will be launching Health Gold. And so um, now I would like to you know, move on to our speakers who are gonna dig in a little bit deeper into some of the more um, overarching uh, actions that we will have in Health Gold that are also new to the program. So I'm gonna uh, you know, turn it over to Karen to um, start talking to us about uh, health and all policies. Uh, let's make sure I can share my screen here. Um, and let's see, are you seeing the, the screen? All good. All good? Okay, now I just have to bring up my notes page, um, let's see here. Uh, hmm. oh, I can't seem to do that. Um, well, we'll just go ahead, uh, kind of wing it without my, <laughs> without my notes page. Karen, if it would help, I can share, I oh, can share your presentation yeah, and then I you can seem to minimize it so I can get to my um, yeah, why don't we do that? That might be Okay. Good. All right, let me, let me take that. So hello everyone. I am Karen Lowry from the Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy at Rutgers, a place many of you are familiar with. Um, and while she pulls up the presentation. Um, are you seeing it? I don't yeah. see it yet. Myself, no. Does I any... see it. I okay. see it. Oh, okay. okay. Okay, I guess it's under, yeah. Okay, it is there. Let me make sure I can see it. Okay. So um, this is a uh, whirlwind tour, <laughs> I'm calling it, of a full day training that Leanne Von Hagen, who's also pictured there, and myself, um, have started offering at Rutgers in a continuing ed um, department. Uh, and we've, we've uh, offered it once. We're going to be offering it again in June, um, probably two to three times a year. And it's a full day course, um, but we, we're just uh, giving you a really high level snapshot of it in, this, in the next 10 minutes or so. So we can go to the next slide. And the idea of the class is that uh, we run through social determinants of health, which, which Lauren already did uh, very completely. And then we talk about what health in all policies is. And then we go through a whole host of ways you can implement health in all policies and some of the challenges. Oh, and then that last bullet is actually supposed to say HIAP action, not challenges. Um, and then today, we're just going to briefly tell you what the, the sustainable Jersey action is that is related to health and all policies. So next slide. And we build from the, def the very broad definition of health that the World Health Organization uses, which is that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not just the absence of disease. And going along with that definition is the concept that health is actually a right of an individual and a social justice issue, and that it is a public good, and therefore governments have a responsibility to consider the health of populations. Um, next slide. 
And I won't belabor this one because we already talked about social determinants. Um, this is a like a 25 year old diagram, but it's still one of the best ones out there. Uh, we call it the, the social determinant of health rainbow. Oh, and so, yeah, and it, and it just is another way of um, displaying that a person's genetics in the red circle in the middle is just one part of their health and that all those other rings of the rainbow are things that are impacted by decisions that are made in, in the public realm. If we can go to the next slide. So health in all policies is a response to this reality that there's many complex and linked issues, challenging issues that require innovation, new, new policies and structures that kind of break down all those silos that uh, traditionally govern how decisions are made. Um, so the goal is that decision makers in all those areas are better informed about the health equity and sustainability consequences of various options while decisions and programs are being developed. Um, next slide. So why does it matter? It matters because um, ultimately uh, we know that those, those determinants of health extend beyond just the health sector. They're not things that just the health department can influence. And they are made at various levels of government. So it's something that has to be woven into various um, levels of government that make those decisions. And um, because it's very intersectoral um, and it's something that um, should be explicitly um, ex explicitly uh, strived for or else it, it won't happen. So next slide. And some of the terminology, um, you probably, you know, you hear the term upstream. Um, so health and all policies is a very upstream concept. In other words, trying to change how you do things at the start so that the outcomes farther down will be more positive. Um, it's also very comprehensive, um, as we already mentioned, intersectoral. Um, if you don't purposely force health outside of the health department, it, it may not happen. So it's, it's necessary to build, to uh, build structures that will make it uh, influence the other sectors. Um, so next slide. And how do we do that? Um, well, some of the things that make health and all policies successful are that it builds on the concept of co-benefits. So it's not just something where health, the health people say, you need to add, you know, a bike lane to this project because it's good for health. You know, well, that is good for health, but you, it also has most of those things that improve health also have co-benefits. It also makes it safer. It also improves the flow for the you know traffic. It also brings people to easier to the downtown businesses or you know so there's economic reasons, um, there's health reasons, there's um, environmental reasons. So uh, building on those co-benefits, it also engages stakeholders. It, um, it's something that involves all levels of government, um, community groups and businesses to work together to identify those co-benefits and those ways that health um, improvements can also benefit other sectors. Uh, it's built on the concept of opportunities. So it could be something that you just do for a one-time collaboration. There's a great window of opportunity to bring health to the table on a certain program. But ideally, it's, there's also a window of opportunity for larger pro, uh, problems where there's you know, an issue, there's a policy being considered, and there's the right politics um, 
to kind of uh, use that opportunity to, to begin the health in all policies framework at, at whatever government level you're, you're working at. Um, so looking for those windows of good opportunity. Um, and then it also is something that promotes larger you know, equity goals as well. So next slide, I'll try to get through quickly um, some of the tactics. We can go right to the next one. The broader categories of tactics um, to achieve, it. tactics is not a very good word, it's a, so let's say strategies, um, are, are that there can be structural ways to do it. So forming like a standing cross-sector task force is a good health in all policies um, method. And so there would be, you know, health people on the task force, but there'd also be people from representing other interests and that that task force would serve to review um, decisions and make sure that, you know, health is considered in those decisions. Um, there can be just procedural things, maybe not, you know, not a new structure, but just a procedure that overlays the existing structure. Um, procedures could be adopted like, um, we'll look at a few of them very quickly in the next few slides. Um, things like instituting checklists or doing health impact assessments on certain projects, um, implementing some kind of like a review process uh, that doesn't exist yet where where things go through like a health review um, as they're being considered. And then evaluation, um, thinking about ways to build in evaluative uh, measures to kind of look back on decisions and see how did they affect health outcomes. Next slide is that, and just showing how, um, health and all policies can be embedded either, either at that sort of one program at a time, or it can be at the level of larger policies, like looking at your zoning, your building codes, things that's gonna affect more than one project, or it can be system-wide, just sort of really building that health lens into your whole um, procedure. Next slide is, um, just, uh, I'm gonna do really quickly through here that, that it's also, these are some of the things that have been found to be uh, create um, more successful health in all policies efforts is when there's uh, support of top leadership, when there are champions at all levels who really believe in it, including outside the government, like a university might be a, a real strong supporter of what's, uh, of the healthy, you know, healthy community design concepts and health impact assessment courses and things, and they can support um, the initiative. Um, institutionalizing it um, makes it more successful when there's actual people assigned to roles um, in, in new procedures and structures. And also when it goes out into the neighborhoods and there's actually neighborhood programs that support health in all policies, things like neighborhood watch programs or neighborhood beautification. And, and it all kind of works towards um, improved health goals. Next slide. Uh, we just wanted to walk quickly through, I know I'm probably running out of time, at uh, just three of the things. And again, in our six hour course, we, we spend a lot more time on each of these um, tools, but just to give you a flavor, uh, one way to implement health and all policies at like a municipal level in particular would be uh, adopting a checklist. Um, next slide is, um, it's a way to have like a single document that kind of serves as a one-stop shop to inventory health considerations. Um, it, it's it's nice because it's malleable. Um, you can kind of adjust adjust it to uh, different topics or to different levels of um, intensity, uh, depending how you know big the project is or or little. It's flexible. 
And it's a way to have, have some accountability. You know, you've reviewed this, you've checked the boxes for you know 20 things, and it it um, it can trigger maybe some follow-up actions or some evaluative measures as well. Um, next slide is just an example of the one that we have developed along with Lauren um, that is really just hot off the presses, um, a sample checklist that we've developed uh, sort of aiming to like municipal decision making. Um, and we don't have time to walk through it, but it, it will be out there and available um, as a, a checklist tool for health and all policies. Um, next is we also talk about model resolutions. So things that can be more formally adopted, like a, resolu a resolution being easier. Um, there, you also could go the route of a full blown ordinance, but we found and looking across the country that communities are tending to go towards these resolutions that uh, just stresses um, that it designed to help a municipality take those initial steps towards building health and all policies into their procedures and uh, structure. Next slide is just the first page. Okay, I only have a minute. Uh, the first page of a model resolution that we go over in our, in our, our class. It has four basic elements, um, mostly just sort of uh, establishing that health is important, um, establishing a task force, um, directing the way that health will be considered in policies and like requiring a, like a report every once in a while about um, how it, health and all policies is working. Uh, next slide, really quick. I'm not even going to talk about these, but oh, so that talked about the four parts of the model resolution. You can also build health into master plans, but I won't spend much time on that because that'll be covered later. But uh, we have examples from Trenton and Camden of, of doing that as well. And I don't really have time to walk through this, but it really is just a summary of the benefits of doing HIAP and some of the challenges. Um, we can provide these slides. So if, if you want to read through those, um, yeah, let's just walk through quickly a couple more slides. There's a lot of resources out there. And really what we've built is from the resources that are out from starting from World Health and other, you know, international groups, and then a lot of the national planning and health groups have resources out there uh, to help communities. And then finally, with Sustainable Jersey, we've been working with Lauren for the last what, year and a half or so um, on the integrating health and municipal decision making action. And um, We've drafted it to be uh, 10 points for sending two staff members to the health and all policies training course or something equivalent, um, similar to what we offer at Rutgers. And then um, oh, this looks like this got the formatting got messed up a little bit. Um, and then uh, additional points for um, completing the HIAP checklist, actually that's part of the 10 points, that would be part of the course. And then another 10 points, so that's 10, and then 10 for adopting a resolution and another five for creating a task force. So with that, I went over time, sorry about that. Um, and that's, that's my presentation, thank you. Yeah, Karen, apologies. It looks like some form got messed up. On it did, yeah. We'll yeah, correct that, that for uh, the final presentation right. is up online. Yep. Um, okay, so next, thank you, Karen. That was a really great overview of uh, health and all policies. And then sort of to take it into the next level, um, Chuck is going to talk about how to, um, you know, how incorporating health in all land use policies is uh, really valuable because as we all know, uh, the planning and zoning boards have a lot of impact on the decisions that uh, impact our health, a lot of authority on those decisions. So 
Take it away, Chuck. Uh, thank you. Just an uh, FYI, we're only seeing like sort of part of your presentation right now. There you go. You got it? Got it. Okay. Nope. It just shrunk again. There you go. All right. So, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, hope everyone's enjoying this fine day. Um, Hopefully you have access to a window as I do to at least look at it as we uh, sit in front of the computer here. Um, so as introduced, I am Chuck Latini, uh, president of the American Planning Association, New Jersey chapter. We are a uh, professional trade organization comprising most of those whom work directly on planning and zoning related matters across every one of the 565 municipalities across this great state of ours. Um, our organization has a broad range of expertise, but in general, um, a good planner knows a little about a lot, and most importantly, how to connect the dots, which is really the probably the most critical uh, part of integrating health into uh, planning and zoning, um, as everything in life is, is connected in some way, shape, or form. Um, the vast majority of my work um, as someone proficient in crystal ball reading, or at least I try to be, uh, feels a little bit like playing master the obvious at times, but I don't want to, uh, uh, you know, say that, you know, and downplay the true in intricacies inherent in community life and the difficulties in achieving um, that balance across the very broad spectrum of issues that you all have to deal with, uh, but our time um, spent pondering both the real and esoteric, um, experiencing real places and how they work or don't is, is a valuable resource to communities. Um, and, and we rely quite a bit on partnerships as, as Karen had uh, iterated with, with all these different organizations out there. There's a lot of uh, expertise from a wide variety of folks, um, including importantly, um, the residents of the state, many of whom perhaps don't understand the level of planning necessary um, to uh, put together a plan that leads to zoning, but with some guidance, they certainly know their communities very well and are, uh, are crucial in helping uh, planning professionals and elected officials um, guide important decisions. Um, as you've heard um, already, good health comes through many forms. Um, we're beating an important drum here, folks. Um, Karen talked um, health in all policies, which dovetails right into land use planning and, and the opportunities we see through the municipal land use uh, development process. Of course, we have diet and exercise, you know, the nuts and bolts of what everybody thinks of when they think of, of, of health, but how do we access these things? Um, we have the environment as well air quality, water quality, aesthetic qualities. Um, also, you know, cause the aesthetics do, um, you know, inevitably lead themselves towards quality of life and, and thus, you know, and the economic health of a community as well. So land use planning done holistically involves all com components of a community's, what I call an urban ecosystem. Um, that directly affect both personal and environmental conditions. So, um, you, know, a, you know, a good master planning effort deals with zoning and design standards that ensure not only proper location of housing and its ability to access goods and services through the commercial zones that you set up or the mixed use zones you set up, but it also can affect um, design issues that affect one's desire or ability to at all um, use their feet rather than the car in some instances. Um, it also deals with placement of our parks and recreational facil facilities um, and, and in similar manners. Um, it sets standards by which environmental quality can be considered such as filtration of stormwater and um, you know, adherence to the new stormwater regulations. Um, preservation of environmentally sensitive lands, um, you know, trees, tree ordinances that can help um, aid air filtration. Um, and let us not forget, you know, mitigating natural disaster potential as well. So, you know, planning also 
really deals with roads and our ability to uh, safely utilize them, walking, biking, and even directly affecting our desires to use them. All these pieces really coming together is important. Um, the balance of life is so fragile that even the visual environment impacts psychological health and how we might move about from, from a physical standpoint as well. So viewing planning and land development through the health lens really means we're considering people first, not parking a car, not necessarily a tax rateable, but people. And if we think about people first, then we're thinking about uh, the way things will naturally come together. Sounds a little hippy dippy sometimes, kumbaya. You know, if that's what you're thinking, uh, you're kind of behind the eight ball because while, you know, uh, I really think uh, a holism matters. If the sum of the parts of your community don't end up being greater than the, the sum of the whole, um, you're really missing out on opportunities to leverage resources, leverage uh, you know, both human and, and, and uh, financial capital. So sidewalks and bike lanes are great, but what purpose do they serve? What do they connect to? How are they serving the market? Is what we're planning value added or just checking a box? So that's where the master plan really has the opportunity to connect those dots, that it's not a check box checking exercise, it's an integration exercise. Um, do our residents have access to healthy food choices or merely bodegas with you know, soda and candy? How do we interface with our public health officials and, 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 and do outreach? And you know, a whole host of different things that can be built into that common vision that a master plan um, uh, sets up. So in New Jersey, these questions can be answered um, and addressed through uh, the municipal master plan. It serves as the foundation and regulations governing health that Lauren spoke about. Um, it also you know, can be an exceptionally powerful tool that is grossly underutilized uh, you know, in many communities throughout the state um, because you know, really a good master plan will set a, a solid vision and chart a path forward. Um, they should not be viewed as hindrances. They are a community's touchstone, a roadmap uh, to improving both economic and social conditions, if you will. Because of exactly these reasons, Sustainable Jersey thought it was appropriate to take the next step forward by including um, the municipal master plan and its process um, into, into, their, uh, uh, into their process. And I could tell you as somebody on the land use and transportation committee that we have we worked on this action for a number of years and, and, and didn't release it, not because we didn't believe in it, but because of the investment it takes to do it correctly in time and finances. And there were a lot of actions to take up before the big dog here, the master plan. But good master plans work. Um, the public process that accompanies laying the foundation toward a collective vision can be tedious. To some elected officials, it's scary to open up oneself to public analysis, even scrutiny, criticism sometimes, but done well, I've seen it really act as a constituency builder um, and, 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 and utilize as a tool, to, uh, a, a tool for governance. So let's look at the master plan and its purposes um, as a new action with, that seeks health integration. The municipal land use law states that a planning board may prepare and after public hearing adopt a master plan um, or component parts thereof to guide the use of lands within a municipality that protects the public health, safety, and promotes the general welfare. Without much guidance on what constitutes a well-written master plan in the MLUL, this action really is intended to strengthen the public health aspect of a master plan in a way that is both instructive and actionable. But when you look at the purpose of the law, you, you really see um, you know, a lot of these issues baked right in. Um, the municipal land use law has 12 purposes behind planning and zoning. These are a few. Um, obviously, you know, as I stated before, the health, safety, and welfare, um, to encourage compatible land use, design and aesthetic designs, air, light, quality, uh, all minimizing you know, 
uh, conflicts between land uses and, and improving systems in general. So that sounds like health to me, um, you know, making sure that all these things work together as a system, you know, just like one part of the body doesn't act independently of another, a community really doesn't act independently of one another. And if it does, you start to have problems, you know, things start to malfunction. Since the master plan serves as a basis for municipal zoning, in addition to a variety of related land use practices, um, uh, we have already addressed strong guidance in the area of health may seem like a nuance, but it really provides municipalities with a tool to ask the right questions from a variety of perspectives as the master plan is developed or re examined So since towns have to do it as required by law every 10 years, at least the re-examination report, why not utilize this action, including its tiers of opportunities to strengthen public health aspect within the current municipal framework for planning that you already have, um, you know, retrofit that seems like easy but extremely valuable points to me. Um, and, and, and one that uh, can have lasting impacts deep into the future. So as this action uh, potentially ties together land development review process and public health together, ensuring that positive and negative health impacts are considered um, are, are important. So look at your process, redefine it if you have to, be inclusive. I like an iterative process that partners with investors, the developers right up front. It makes, it makes the actual planning and, and approval and zoning approval process um, that much easier um, and predictable. Involve the, your environmental folks, your public safety folks, economic development, and your health folks. I mean, a lot of these, in, in some of our towns, these folks are already involved, but in many, they're not. These different lenses offer great perspective in, in how a community moves forward in, in a predictable and transparent matter. And that's, that last point is critical. Even if you don't believe in planning for public health and you're just, and you're just looking at this for, through a financial lens, major development decisions uh, moving forward um, are investments really in your community that should be leveraged. And if you leverage them through building healthy and truly sustainable development, you know, both the economy and the social framework of your town um, can, can thrive and survive and thrive. So folks, you know, when they're looking to invest in a community are much more willing to invest in a community where they know their investment will be leveraged by a community that is proactive and, and a process that they know that at the end of the day is going to lead to, to good returns. So marry those two things together. And, uh, and, I, and I think the opportunity to really, um, you know, strengthen uh, your master plan and, and gain some valuable points through the Sustainable Jersey uh, uh, program um, is, is an opportunity worth looking at. So thank you. Great, thanks Chuck. Um, there is a question, uh, but we can save it. I'm not sure, Melanie, how much time do we have uh, left to Chuck's 15 minutes? Chuck has a minute left. He has a minute left. Um, Marco is asking for, uh, please say more about the investments and value of the health and system element for the master plan and possible examples of where in New Jersey or in other communities can inform the development of such a, an element. You're muted, you're muted, Chuck. So, yeah, so we, we we did a health and food systems element with uh, the city of Trenton as part of their Trenton uh, 250 master plan. Um, APA National gave us a grant to do a, uh, a, a pilot project with them. They were doing a very ambitious master plan effort that um, you know, enabled us to, to dovetail onto their process, um, really integrated their, um, the Trenton Health Collaborative. And you know some of the some of the impacts that have that come from that, um, you know, may not currently it may not have led to to big investment on the dev land development side, but it certainly has had impacts on how the community was able to work with 
um, all these little bodegas because it, you know it was a food desert, and and ensuring that you know healthy uh, choices were offered in in a lot of these bodegas that are that are all throughout the, the city, and and that was met through you know you know great pleasure of the, in the neighborhoods and even even since the bodegas have started to even you know offer more, um, so you know. All these all these little things matter, and 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 certainly when you're when you're looking at, you know, investing the time and effort to to uh, to put forward on this, it's a it's a leap of faith, right? But when you do it correctly, you know, inevitably something starts to happen and things start to snowball. Okay, great. Thanks, Chuck. Um, I, I do want to mention, uh, because Kathy put in the, the questions uh, about whether these actions are live on the website yet, and I will say that all three of these, so the, the integrating health in um, municipal decision making and the health, the master plan health element that Chuck just talked about, as well as the action that Michael will speak about with local boards of health, will all be forthcoming for the July launch of Health Gold. So. Stay tuned for that. So now I'm going to turn it over to Michael to talk more about the local boards of health, what they are, what their powers are, you know, their purpose, and how it ties into your communities and sustainable. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Let me get my presentation up here. Okay. Everybody should now see uh, my screen, do they? Okay. We do. Uh, very good. Well, as I said, my name is Mike Richmond. I'm the legal counsel for the New Jersey Local Boards of Health Association. And this is the website uh, for the Local Board of Health Association. And uh, that's gonna become important as we talk about some of the requirements for uh, this particular action. All right. I'm going to get a little bit legal easy because I am an attorney <laughs> and so therefore I function in this uh, area. To start off with, every municipality is required to have a local board of health. This is required in Title 26 specifically Title 26, 3-1, and that's on your board. You will note, however, that the last section of this is in red because this is an exception to the general proposition that every municipality must have a local board of health. Local boards of health are one of the foundational blocks of public health. They, as you will see, serve uh, as the interface between the community and the uh, health agency. They uh, serve as a uh, way to uh, monitor what the health agency is doing and uh, to make sure that programs that the community feels are necessary in the area of public health are in fact being conducted. Uh, or a particular public health need is being met. So what is a local board of health? Well, in, in general, in the uh, administrative code, it's defined as a county municipal board of health or a board of health of any regional, local, or special health district having the authority to regulate public health or sanitation by ordinances. That's a mouthful, and it doesn't tell you a lot. Uh, but it tells you that there is a continuing history in the state of New Jersey that public health and the public health enforcement of the sanitation code, which is all of the state statutes that deal with public health issues, including the regulation of uh, swimming pools, restaurants, uh, tanning salons, uh, places where you get a uh, tattoo. All of these are state statutes. And the enforcement of these state statutes is done not by 
uh, agencies or agents of the state government, but are done at the local level. So there are certain core functions uh, that have been identified uh, with regard to a local board of health. And those core functions are the assessment, assurance, and policy development with regard to uh, public health. And that requires that there be by the public of uh, the local board of health an assessment of the needs of the community with regard to public health, uh, assurance that uh, the needs that have been identified uh, are going to be met and that they're going to be met in an effective and a financially viable way. And it involves policy development. In other words, the manner in which the uh, public health agency is going to meet the community needs. Now, those three uh, functions of the local health have been expanded uh, to be four, uh, to be five uh, different uh, functions. The first of them is administration. Well, this is the fact that it requires the local board of health to adopt a clearly defined uh, statement of mission uh, for the local board of health. Just exactly what is it going to do? Uh, there is program planning uh, based upon uh, what the needs of the community that have been identified are, uh, making sure that those programs uh, are going to be developed that meet those needs. And as we will see, that's one of the major functions that we're asking be uh, reinforced uh, in uh, this particular action. There is an evaluation of organizational effectiveness. You wanna make sure that the health agency is performing their mission in such a way that the actual needs of the community are being met uh, and that they are being met effectively and efficiently. Uh, we wanna make sure that the uh, staff uh, maintain their certifications, their knowledge, uh, their growth, and their education. Uh, we've seen, uh, particularly during the last pandemic, that it has been critical uh, that people that have been trained predominantly as being registered environmental health specialists uh, have also going to have uh, training in being uh, contact tracers uh, doing vaccinations uh, and doing a whole host of other uh, actions and uh, jobs that they really never were uh, in initially employed for, but have over the course of time gotten the training so that they can meet those needs. And during the pandemic, we have been uh, called upon, they have been called upon uh, to participate uh, in all of those areas. So the evaluation of uh, organizational effectiveness is uh, very important. Financial stewardship, uh, where you have an independent uh, board of health, uh, what we call autonomous, the financial stewardship is uh, important. That board is required to develop a specific budget uh, for the public health function that the community uh, requires. Then you have number five, which is probably the most important uh, function of the local board of health. And that's the fact that it represents the interest of the citizens, okay, in the community. Uh, this is the interface where you get uh, by dint of having public meetings hopefully going out and conducting meetings, not just at the municipal building, but in various communities, depending upon the size of your municipality and various communities to determine the needs of those people uh, with regard to all of the uh, health elements that we've been talking about in this webinar. Now, 
we often have a situation in which there is confusion between a local board of health versus a local health department. And we can solve this fairly easily. This is the statutory definition of what a health officer is required to do. And this says, any duly appointed health officer shall, and this is where it's important, subject to the superior authority of the local board appointing him, be its general agent for, and it goes on and lists the various responsibilities of the health officer with regard uh, to their interface with the local board of health. But this statute makes clear that the health officer is responsible to the local board of health. They're the ones that ultimately will determine the policy and the effectiveness of the programs that the health officer is overseeing and implementing in his department. He's the chief executive officer with regard to the performance of health uh, services within the community, uh, but he does answer to the health department. Uh, I'm sorry, to the local board of health. Now, the local board of health is the employer. The health officer is the CEO and the health department are the staff within uh, this particular entity. And if you think about it in those terms, it's clear when we are talking about health uh, board as opposed to health department, uh, we can keep in our minds just exactly what the relationship uh, between them is. Now, the local board of health and the health department obviously uh, work very closely together. Uh, as you saw by the uh, previous uh, statutory requirement, there is an actual requirement that the health officer share with the local board of health information that is obtained in the course of the performance of the duties with the health department. There are inspectors that go out, conduct inspections with regard to local restaurants, uh, local tanning salons, uh, local swimming pools. Uh, there are a whole host of uh, issues that the health department is responsible for, including getting down to doing uh, heating complaints uh, during the winter time. So all of this information needs to go back to the local board of health so that there can be a determination as to what additional programs uh, might be necessary and uh, how they're gonna be paid for. Uh, the local board of health is oftentimes the place in which the availability of grants, uh, uh, another uh, funding mechanisms uh, can be researched, can be known, and that there can be an application made for them. So that identified programs uh, that are needed within the community can be funded. And then there's also the question as to whether or not additional staffing is necessary and whether or not that has to be done by adding additional paid positions, or whether you can develop a volunteer staff that can meet some of your needs. Very frequently, we will find that local boards of health have supporting them volunteer groups of nurses, doctors, uh, other uh, health uh, officials that are volunteering their time uh, to assist uh, the local board of health. And it's up to the local board of health to determine whether or not uh, that's the uh, level of uh, support that they want the health department to have or whether or not additional paid staff would be necessary. And that's part of the budgetary program. Uh, the health officer does, uh, the health department does the professional work and the local board of health is responsible for developing the policy, the plans, and evaluating how well the health department is doing what the local board has identified as being the necessary programs. Okay, who is it that sits on a local board of health? Well, 
This varies because this depends upon just exactly how uh, the local Board of Health has been structured. If it comes from the statute, there are some times that statutes require that doctors, either actual doctors that live in the community or school physicians, or in certain instances, they identify school nurses, uh, may be identified as people necessary to be on a local board of health. And there was one outlier there, and that's the fact that in townships with less than 20,000 people, uh, they can uh, set up a situation in which the uh, members of the township committee are the board of health, as well as a school nurse and a tax assessor. And that's because in the old days, <laughs> the actual boards of health determined the budget uh, and the tax assessment that was going to be made uh, for the uh, uh, production of uh, public health. Okay, but most of the time, it's simply people that are interested in their community and are willing to go out and spend time to listen learn and to develop plans. Uh, there are oftentimes people that are tangentially involved with public health, maybe don't even realize it. Uh, members of local fire department, local first aid squad. Uh, there can be uh, people that uh, do serve as school nurses or uh, serve in uh, capacities as social work, uh, zoning and planning as we've seen. Uh, there's a whole host of backgrounds of people that would be legitimate uh, members of your local board of health. Now, is there more than one form of a board of health? And the answer to the question, unfortunately, is yes. Uh, there are five types. Uh, the first one is what we call autonomous boards. These are boards that are created by statute and are often defined by the form of local government. For instance, a uh, borough uh, that is operating under the borough form of government has an autonomous board of health, separate and apart from the council. And that local board of health has all of those functions, those five functions that we uh, identified and they have the autonomous power to uh, implement uh, the local budget, the hiring of the uh, health officer, uh, identifying the policies that they want followed, etc. Then we have different forms. One of them is the county local board of health, and this is where the county has decided that they will uh, form a local board of health, having representatives from up to five uh, communities within the county uh, and one freeholder. Uh, they have countywide uh, jurisdiction uh, within their county. There is then what is known as regional health commissions. This is where two or more municipalities have joined together to create an association to provide local health services. Here, the Regional Health Commission actually has a health department that they have created. They appoint the health officer, uh, they supervise it, they go through all the steps, the same as an autonomous uh, local board would do. Similarly, as we said, with the county, where there is a county local board of health, very frequently, uh, there is a county health department that works in conjunction with uh, that entity. You then have a situation in which there are certain special charters throughout the state of New Jersey, and they will indicate specifically how the health department is, that is associated with that local charter will be constituted. Then finally, there is the advisory uh, board of health, which is created by a municipal ordinance. Uh, this is not a statutory uh, requirement, and uh, it is something that has been suggested in uh, certain court cases, and I will refer to you to those. Now, 
Michael, um, we have to get to question and answer because we only have about five minutes left to the event. So would you be able to just quickly summarize um, the end of what's the in the action that's forthcoming? Sure. Very, very briefly, high okay. level. All right. What we want to uh, know here with the action is the fact that we make a distinction between those boards, which are the autonomous local boards of health, and they have a path to 10 points, which would involve them doing basically two things. And the two things is that they must have the correct number of uh, people on their boards. They have to be properly constituted and those boards then have to meet at least once every quarter and they must meet annually with the local board of health, not the local board of health, with the senior member of the health department and at least one member of the municipal governing body. If a, an autonomous board is able to complete those, they'll get 10 points. Boards that are under the Faulkner Act or Walsh Act, and those are ones that do not have autonomous boards. They would be required to do one of two things. They can get five points if the governing body meets at least quarterly as the local board of health and that they obtain the training that we have indicated that is conducted by the New Jersey Local Boards of Health Association. The, the Faulkner and Walsh Act can uh, obtain an additional five points if they create an advisory board of health, that advisory board of health will meet at least once a quarter will obtain the necessary uh, training and uh, would uh, meet with the uh, health department at least annually and will have a member of the governing body at that seminar. And that wraps up the uh, actual action. Great, and so we will be, um... We will be uh, sharing, you know, these actions when they come online uh, in the end of July when uh, when the um, sorry <laughs> the uh, health gold launches. So um, look for more information about that. I just also um, wanted to sorry about this, guys. I thought I had was up on. Uh, this is not good. <laughs> this is like no, no 101 on how to uh, share your slides. But I just wanted to show you guys before we open it up for Q&A uh, that there are more, uh, more events coming for the summit and you can find out those uh, events. We have one more day tomorrow um, at this link here on the uh, Sustainable Jersey website. And then also the, like I said, the recordings and the presentations will be posted next uh, next week. And so we have a movie night uh, panel discussion tonight at seven o'clock. And then there's sessions tomorrow on the digital schools program and energy efficiency and renewable energy. So um, I think we answered all of the questions. There, there are no more, if we have a couple of minutes left, if you have any questions, please, uh, you know, post them in the Q&A or you can raise your hand um, and we can unmute you. Uh, I just wanted to show that Lois Krauss early on in the presentation had asked about um, whether these uh, actions take into account of specifically the local needs assessment action, the workers within the community and not just the residents. And my response was, Yes, they do. It's, it's who lives and works within your community will be considered within that needs assessment. Um, and then, as I mentioned, Kathy had asked about, uh, you know, uh, 
when these actions are going to be posted and they'll be posted for the launch of Health Gold. So um, if you, like I said, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. We can unmute you for our speakers. We'll give another minute or so to see if anybody raises their hand or posts anything in q and I'm surprised with all of this, this chock full of information presentations we gave today that there's not more questions, but I guess people have to digest this. And then once we, once we launch, I'm sure there will be lots more questions. So without seeing any, uh, any questions, we're going to uh, end the session. Thank you so much to Chuck, Karen, and Michael for being with us today. Thank you everybody for joining us. It's a beautiful day out there. Um, we appreciate you giving up an hour and 15 to be with us. Uh, go enjoy the day. See ya. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks team. Good job. Melanie.